Richard Pryor revolutionized comedy. If you don't know who Richard is or even tried to look up Richard, then you, you shouldn't be doing comedy. Mr. Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor. He's the GOAT. It's like going to church without a Bible. <laughs> the only way to understand a white man's problems was actually to become a white man. <laughs> exposing America's darkest impulses like no other comic before him. He pushed those boundaries. You didn't know how much trouble he was going to get in. You ever notice how nice white people get when there's a bunch of niggas around? Born on December 1st, 1940, Richard Pryor is raised in Peoria, Illinois, surrounded by crime, sex, and racial segregation. We knew that he was raised in a brothel. Basically, his mother was a whore and that he saw some pretty rough things as a child with his mother having relations with men. And his grandma took care of him. And, you know, he was really kind of left on his own. Who believed in you? Who cared about you? Richard Franklin, Lennox Thomas Bryant III. You were 15 years old? 14. When, when your first child was born? Yeah, yeah. And then after she was born? I didn't know my father was making love to her, too. But it would be boom. Richard Pryor's childhood was horrific. I mean, he was abused by his father. His grandmother was pretty much ran the brothel. He had uncles that were pimps, hustlers. They raised him. He didn't have a normal family. When I was a kid, I got disciplined. Uh, you know, like most kids, you know, get spankings, you know, and, and, and little whoopings. I got beatings. <laughs> no, my old man would punch me out. That was it, you know. And, and, and he'd brag around the neighborhood, you know, my son never cries when I whoop him. <laughs> Desperate for attention and an escape from his brutal family life, young Richard finds comedy in the dark corners of Peoria. He told me that he learned drama from being in the streets. He said, we didn't have a drama class, so you couldn't express ideas about being an actor. You just have to pick up what you got from the streets. But the bright lights of Hollywood are a world away from segregated Peoria. And after a brief stint in the army, Richard returns home and begins performing at local venues catering to African-American audiences, eventually graduating to the Chitlin Circuit. The Chitlin Circuit, guys, let me see. It's black. The Chitlin Circuit was basically the black comedy circuit. You had Red Fox, you had Dick Gregory, you had Moms Mabley. You had all of these amazing comedians that was the black circuit because they were not allowed to perform to white audiences, you know what I mean? But the segregated Chitlin circuit existed in the shadow of America's mainstream entertainment industry, offering little financial reward. Eager to cross over to a white audience, an ambitious prior sets his sights on the comedy clubs of New York City following in the footsteps of another black comedian. As a grown-up, I think that uh, Frankenstein and the Mummy are about the two slowest guys in the world. I don't understand how they could even catch people. I'd have so much fun with guys like, yeah, come on, try it, catch me. Bill was the most successful comedian in the business at that time. Uh, huge, huge uh, uh, audience. He was talking about things that are most relatable to a uh, white crossover audience. Every comic was trying for that because that's where the biggest audience is. In order to get to the mainstream, you, do, you had to be routine. You couldn't be too black. And if you did talk about the black experience, you had to make it to where it was clear and they understood. Bill Cosby was this, you know, clean cut, Temple University, educated guy, good looking guy, doing clean comedy, you know? And Richard wanted to be him. And Richard was like, I want to be like that dude, man. The dude is fucking amazing. All my people have to do to live forever is follow these 10 simple rules I have written on this plaque. Ah, oh, come on, Moses, you're putting us on. <laughs> Mind if I read them first? Yeah, that's, thou shalt not, uh, that's cute. <laughs> thou shalt not, uh, are you serious? <laughs> Pryor's squeaky clean act works a little too well. I was uh, working for Bill Cosby, and uh, Bill thought that Richard was uh, copying uh, some of his act. 
And we had to call him into our office to tell him that uh, he shouldn't do that. Did you ever even unconsciously pick up somebody's line and use it? Oh, on purpose. Oh, I mean, actually... <laughs> I made a lot of money as Bill Cosby. Yeah. <laughs> my mother's Puerto Rican, and my father's Negro, and we live in a real big Jewish tenement building. <laughs> in an Italian neighborhood. Every time I go outside, the kids say, Get him! He's all of them! <laughs> Richard was on his way to building a crossover audience. New York gives Richard access to a huge new audience but it also gives him access to a drug that will haunt him for the rest of his career, cocaine. Pryor had experimented with drugs since his teens, but the highly addictive narcotic quickly becomes an obsession for the burgeoning comic. I, I, I like New York City. I've been working in the village in coffee houses, and I like it because they don't serve any booze, just coffee, ice cream, weird pills, and... <laughs> Despite escalating drug use, Pryor makes a name for himself with white audiences. But that fame comes at a price, especially for black performers. It's exhausting performing for white people. <laughs> I can tell you for black comedians, there's a lot of pressure. Because even if you're not necessarily the urban chitlin circuit sort of comic, right, you still feel pressure to be that because sometimes white people don't want to receive you unless you shucking and jiving. You know, it's sort of like relegating all these black comics to one spot. He had to, at the beginning, do some maneuvering to be able to get the next booking. So maybe he doesn't tell the joke he wants to tell that might even be about the, the white people or something because he might offend the manager who might not have him back. Securing a residency at the Aladdin Hotel in Las Vegas, Pryor now commands $3,000 a week in fees and the respect of Sin City's showbiz elite. But in the fall of 1967, Pryor reaches a breaking point. I was a showgirl working in shows in Las Vegas in the late 60s when he was there performing. The only people working in Vegas that were black were the janitors and the kitchen staff and people like that. He got up on the stage and he looked down and he saw these white people. It was all white. There were no black people in the show coming to see the shows in Vegas, even coming to see the black people. It hit home. I mean, it, you know, it messed with your head. So he he just said, fuck this. I, I, I can't take this shit anymore because he was just tired of not being himself. He was tired of not telling the truth. Then, Richard does the unthinkable. He walks out on the packed house and ultimately on his lucrative residency. He basically was like, I'd rather be never do comedy again and homeless than please whitey again. 